good morning good afternoon good evening depending on which of part of the world you are in hello everyone hearty welcome to today's session of learn from the legends by now we are completing three and a half years of uninterrupted lectures from the legends of this field and today again we have another legend probably the one who has done maximum work in the field of neonatal ethics professor mark maturio we are fortunate to have him with us today so i have great pleasure on behalf of national neonatology forum india and my own behalf to welcome you sir i also have great pleasure to welcome the moderators for today two senior neonatologists from india dr somashegar nimbalkar from gujarat india and colonel dr subhash chandra shaw from indian army delhi welcome to you both of you now we would straight away the go on to the lecture and as is the practice we will have discussions at the end i would request uh, dr somashegar nimbalkar to introduce the speaker in detail over to you dr nimbalkar uh, thank you dr manoj uh, it's a pleasure to invite everyone and have everyone here uh, on the ethics session of the nnf uh, next series and the learn from the legend which has been going on for three and a half years uh today we have with us uh, dr professor mark mercurio from uh, connecticut yale school of medicine uh, he is currently the professor of pediatrics and director of program of biomedical ethics uh, at yale school of medicine and also concurrently the director of the yale pediatric ethics program at uh, yale new, new haven children's hospital uh, last year he stepped down from being the chief of neonatal perinatal medicine at yale Uh, he has had an illustrious career uh, completing his pre medical studies from uh, princeton university and uh, brown university uh, following which he did his uh, md in from columbia university and uh, completed his pediatric residency and neonatology fellowships uh, at yale university uh, he has been active in neonatology and medical ethics and has been publishing uh, quite a bit and also ensuring education for uh, residents fellows and nurses Uh, he is a member of the medical faculty of the fellowships of auschwitz for the study of professional ethics uh, and is a former chair of the american academy of pediatrics section on bioethics uh, as i said he is also an original co-editor of the american academy of pediatrics residents curriculum in uh, bioethics uh, he is currently a fellow at the hastings center and member of the american pediatric society uh, he lives in uh, connecticut brantford uh, and has uh, with his wife anna and uh, three has three uh, children uh, grown up children uh, thank you uh, professor mark mercury for accepting uh, our invitation and we hope to learn uh, from you and i request everyone uh, who are, are watching uh, this uh, we, this presentation uh, to please put your uh, questions in the q and a box and if you are watching it on youtube uh, in the messages box on youtube and we will answer each of those questions uh, at the end of the lecture uh greetings from dr shaw also and over to you dr mercurio thank you so much dr manoj and dr nabakar and dr shaw as well um, it's an honor to be here with you all um let me try to share my screen so we can get right to it uh let's see if we have this um can you tell me uh manoj are you are you seeing yes. my, my yes I, we are able to see your screen very well okay, do this that should be the first slide we good Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So um, I want to speak today about ethical questions in neonatology. Um, um, as was uh, as was mentioned, that's my interest. Um, I've spent 40 years working in the newborn intensive care unit, also many years studying and uh, writing and teaching about ethics as well. So I want to talk today a bit about where these two come together, about a, a fair, understandable and feasible approach. And I think as neonatologists, we're looking in particular for something that's not only something that's that uh, can stand ethically but also is feasible something we can actually put to use um i have no significant disclosures except that i do take images from the internet i do steal those pictures from from the internet um i want to talk for a bit about uh 
decision making in the NICU. And we'll go over that over this time, specifically issues about ethical decision making. We'll also touch on relevant rights, on the importance of justice, and then ultimately on a, a practical way forward. Um, and I want to focus the discussion, frame the discussion around two fundamental questions um, in neonatology. Let me see if I can make that a little bit cleaner. Two fundamental questions or at, at the cusp of viability. These are questions that we commonly struggle with, I think, all over the world, certainly in the United States, and I suspect all over the world. What's the lowest gestational age for which clinicians should be willing to attempt resuscitation and critical care if requested by informed parents? And the second question is, at what gestational age should clinicians insist on providing attempted resuscitation and critical care? But it's very important to understand as we look at these questions um, that I want to use these as a framework to discuss the approach, but the approach I'm going to suggest to you is applicable beyond questions about extreme prematurity or these specific questions. I think this should be helpful in all of neonatology, indeed in all of pediatrics, the approach I'm going to suggest to you. So when we talk about ethical decision-making in pediatrics, um, we feel that shared decision-making should be our approach. The physician working with the infant's parents um, should be making a decision together. But we recognize there are some things that we as physicians feel we must do or must not do, um, regardless of what the parents, not regardless, but despite what parents might tell us, which is to say that parental authority in this situation is not unlimited. We don't simply do whatever the parents say whenever the parents say it. Their authority should be seen as very strong, but it's not unlimited. So we're left to decide when and how we should seek to uh, overrule their choice or their decisions. Um, but recognizing first that shared decision-making is our initial approach. This is how I want it done, and I want to emphasize that. But there will be times when we disagree. If we disagree, if we're going to refuse a parental request, for example, for attempted resuscitation, I think we need an ethical justification for refusing that request. And this is really at the heart of what I want to talk about today. So how we decide anything in medicine, I think there's two candidate methods. There's two methods that we appeal to most often, the standard of care and appeals to authority. So the standard of care, I think everybody on this call is familiar with. We have certain standards in our profession that tell us, here's how we approach a certain problem. And with a scientific question, we know that um, sometimes that standard might be based on a, a large body of uh, scientific evidence, randomized controlled trials and multi-center trials. And then I think our obligation to adhere to that standard is pretty strong. Our obligation to adhere to that standard is less if it's based not so much on those on the large number of those uh, controlled trials, but rather on smaller data sets. And our obligation is less still if it's based simply on physiologic reasoning without any real data to support us. And um, I think it's most, least of all if it's simply we just got together in a room and we agreed, here's how we're going to approach disease X without any real scientific rationale behind it. It's not a perfect analogy, but it is an analogy that I would draw that is um, uh, that is to say that our, um, our obligation with ethical questions, our obligations to adhere to an ethical standard can similarly be considered if it's based on consideration of all the ethical principles at play, of all the rights at play, and a careful consideration of, of the opinions of our colleagues and then that our obligation to adhere to that standard is high. It might be somewhat lower. It is somewhat lower, I think, in an analogy to the scientific question. If our ethical standard is simply based on, well, we all sat in a room, we had a show of hands, how many think we should do X? And we got this many hands, how many think we should do Y? We got that many hands. And so then we decided. I think sometimes our ethical standards, our standards of care in general, really our justification comes down to because we say so. And I would emphasize that that's a poor justification for a standard of care. And therefore, our obligation to adhere to such a standard of care is not strong if it's just based on because we say so, we being the physicians. The second, and this is where this picture comes from, it refers to appeals to authority. Sometimes we simply want to appeal to an authority and then they'll establish what our approach should be. This is how we're going to answer the difficult ethical question. Should we attempt resuscitation? if for children of this gestational age, whatever that is, for example. And I got the picture here. This is the best I could find on the internet of some uh, of some boys in the uh, late 50s or early 60s playing baseball. Um, this is uh, supposed to represent my, uh, my Midwestern American youth, where we would all be out in the street playing baseball. 
and there would something would happen and there'd be a disagreement on whether uh what the rules said how we should do this and the way we would answer the question was we'd go to see Mrs. Miliotis. Mrs. Miliotis lived down the street. She was always home. She had she was a sports buff. She knew everything about all the sports and all the rules. So if we, a bunch of kids, couldn't agree on something, we would just go see Mrs. Miliotis. We'd tell her the situation, and she would tell us, oh, the answer is he's out. And that's the answer. Okay, so now we knew. And I think that's a good way for a bunch of eight-year-old boys to uh, to answer a question. I don't think it's a good way for adults to answer an ethical question. And we answer them as kids, ask mom, ask dad. You know, these are how we often answer ethical questions. But as adults, I would suggest we need to actually take responsibility for our decisions. And we need to do the hard ethical work, the hard intellectual work that it takes to get that answer. So neither standard of care nor appeals to authority, I believe, are going to be the way we should decide on the answer to these or other questions in neonatology. So what I want to propose to you is something called the IPO framework. I think we need an ethical justification and a sound rationale for what we decide to do. So for any treatment under consideration, in the case we're talking about, it's resuscitation, but again, it could be any treatment under consideration for our population. We seek to determine if a treatment under consideration is ethically impermissible, ethically permissible, or ethically obligatory. If it's ethically impermissible, that means we shouldn't do it and we shouldn't offer to do it. If it's ethically permissible, we should offer, even if the parents don't know enough to ask. We should be willing to do it if the parents want it. And if it's ethically obligatory, we should do it and insist if necessary. And rarely that might involve actually going to the courts. But I have to say rarely that there could be years at a time when we don't go to the courts. We almost never go to the courts with these cases. But that's it. I think any treatment in question can be defined as one of these three, ethically impermissible, permissible, or obligatory. Now, within things that are ethically permissible, and this is a, a not a trivial point, there are some things that are permissible, but still inadvisable. Not really what I'd recommend, but hasn't really crossed that line over to impermissible. Uh, Manoj, can you see my cursor when I move it around here? Uh, yes, yes, it is uh, yes, 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 now it's visible. It's small. Yes. Do you want to increase the size of the cursor? If it is possible, otherwise it's fine. It can be seen, but it's very tiny. Okay. Or the color. If I try to uh, change the size of the cursor, I'll probably like uh, blow up the room or something. I'm not going <laughs> to mess with it, so I'll let it be. Um, fine, it's seen. No, we'll continue. Sir. Okay. It's, it is, again, it's important to understand that some things are not necessarily what we recommend, but still permissible, which is to say, we should still be willing to do them if parents ask. And in similar fashion, some things are advisable, some things we should be willing to do. In fact, something we suggest we would do, but it's not obligatory. So if the parents really don't want us to do it, we should be willing to forego that plan. So you know, how are we gonna locate a treatment on the line? Of course, this is the real question, right? This is the hard ethical work. This is the hard intellectual work. For any treatment under consideration, how do we locate it on this line? And what I'm suggesting to you, my friends, is that it should not be solely by a tradition or training or just because we say so. I think we locate a treatment on that line based on the prognosis for the patient with and without the proposed treatment. We should consider the benefits and burdens to the patient, which includes things like survival, of course, suffering during and after treatment. Um, some examples, some obvious examples from my neonatology friends around the world, antibiotics and a ventilator for bacterial pneumonia in a full-term newborn. Now we know that with bacterial pneumonia in a full-term newborn, there's a significant risk of death without treatment. But we know that with treatment, the vast majority of these children are gonna survive. So here we would consider this because the prognosis is so different with and without the treatment that we would consider uh, in the United States here, if the resources are available, we would consider that to be an obligatory treatment. Similarly, something like genomycin as treatment for cytomegalovirus. Now you, my friends are aware that Genomycin uh, offers no benefit for cytomegalovirus. It's not going to kill the virus. In fact, it could make things worse because, among other things, it could lead to ototoxicity, right? So, genomycin offers harms to the patient, but no benefit to the patient. So, here the prognosis, the difference of prognosis with and without it, are such that we would consider that ethically impermissible. But the action is, the ethical reasoning is based on the benefits and burdens to the patient when we consider the prognosis with and without the treatment in question, whatever that treatment might be. So we're talking about resuscitation. And of course, a good ethics lecture always has to bring out the data. So we'll talk about the data. 
let's take a look at this for a moment if we could. These are data that were just published last year by the Neonatal Research Network in the United States. This is 20 some uh, newborn intensive care units, major academic centers that pool their data and do research together. And if you look with me, please, there's, there's four columns and these are the gestational age at 22 weeks, 23 weeks, 24 weeks and 25 weeks. And if you look inside the red box, you'll see survive to discharge or one year. And what you see is at 22 weeks inside this red box, we see that about 10% survive, 10.9, right? At 23 weeks, it's 49%. At 24 weeks, 69%. And at 25 weeks, it's 79%. Now, of course, survival without treatment for these tiniest of babies, the prognosis is gonna be very, very poor. Survival is exceedingly unlikely without intensive care measures, right? So, and so we see that we can save, this would appear to show that we can save 10% of them at the U.S. major academic centers with treatment, okay, um, but none of them without treatment at 22 weeks. And at 23 weeks, that number comes up to 49%. But there's more to this than just that. So I want to share that with you for just the moment, because this gets us to an important point about looking at these data for any treatment, which is kind of a circular reasoning. You know, some years ago, I asked a colleague when I was uh, giving a visiting lecture if they offered resuscitation at 22 weeks. And he said, of course we don't. And I said, why not? This was good. I thought he had really sorted through the answer. And he said, well, because we've never had a survivor. And I thought, well, that's actually fascinating, of course, because that works even at 25 weeks or 28 weeks. If you don't try and save them, they don't survive. And then, of course, your survival statistics are poor. And that justifies the ongoing approach of not trying to save them. This was really relevant to the data at the time. This is maybe 20 years ago where the Japanese were reporting to be able to save one out of three kids at 22 weeks. That was crazy in the United States, we thought, because we were saving far, far fewer. We were saving, you know, uh, the data that was published then at the academic centers was maybe 6%. But if you looked more closely, if we looked more closely, we found that in the US data, while we were reporting 6% survival at 22 weeks back then, they were only attempting, we were only attempting resuscitation in 18%. So the survival wasn't six out of 100, it was really six out of 18, which of course sounded just like the Japanese data where they were reporting about one in three survival. So it was circular reasoning, a self-fulfilling prophecy that we were looking at survival data, but only among those where we tried. So the relevant question regarding the chance of survival when deciding on resuscitation attempts whether we're having this amongst ourselves as physicians or counseling parents, is not what are the survival data for all children born at this gestation wage, but rather the relevant question is, what would be the chances of survival for this child if we tried, if we actively resuscitated? What would be the chances of survival? And of course, that's a very different number. And this is going back, like I say, nearly 20 years now. But over the years, the U.S. data began to be presented more in that light. And understand, this is relevant not just to extreme prematurity. This is relevant to questions about, for example, trisomy 13 or trisomy 18 or other disorders, I put lethal in quotes, other disorders that were and are still considered by some to be lethal disorders. Trisomy 13, of course, the survival was, was dismal and no one ever tried. So the question really is if parents are considering trying, one of the relevant questions is, well, what would be the chances of survival if we tried? So let's take a look at that a little bit more closely with regard to extreme prematurity. So here we saw that survival to discharge, okay, remember initially under 22 weeks, here we saw in the red box that survival to discharge was 10.9%. But if we look down here in the blue boxes, infants actively treated at birth, and we see here at 22 weeks, that's, that 10% became 30% when we just looked at those where we tried to save them. Now, of course, we may have picked those that were bigger or uh, stronger, or for whatever reason, appeared to us more likely to survive. Nevertheless, that's a dramatically different number from 10% to 30%. Again, similar to the one in three that the Japanese reported a generation ago already. And at 23 weeks, it was 49% of all comers. But if we look at the blue box, those actively resuscitated, it was 55%. So that number changed. Once you got to 24, 25, 69 and 71, or 79 and 70. The numbers didn't change because in the U.S. academic centers at that time, nearly all kids born at 24 and 25 weeks were experiencing uh, attempted resuscitation. But at 22 and 23 weeks, it became very relevant and very important to look at those who were actively treated. And we see about 30% at 22 weeks, 
and 55% at 23 weeks. Remember, we're still trying to figure out the prognosis with and without the treatment. Now, if we look at our friends in Canada, among those who were admitted to the NICU, not moribund, so are, you know relevant to, to active treatment, again, they saw similar numbers, which was at 22 weeks, they had a survival of 32%. At 23 weeks, a survival of 50%. This is 2010 to 2017, roughly the same epoch, right? Now, in Japan, for the Japanese Neonatal Research Network, at 22 weeks, the overall survival was 50, 46%. They were saving, of those admitted to the NICU, they could save about half of those kids. That's really quite remarkable. In Japan, from 2008 to 2012, they were saving about half of those kids born at 22 weeks. That's survival at three years. And if we go to Sweden, again, they show that when they all tried, the obstetricians and neonatologists were trying together at the Uppsala Hospital in Sweden, um, proactive care to all mother infant dyads, including steroids, resuscitation, and intensive care. Again, they were able to save about half of those kids. And the University of Iowa, which is a, a, a major medical center in the United States, in the Midwest, where they're very aggressive with extremely low birth weight babies, they said at 22 weeks, they can save 64% when they try. Now, you see their numbers are very low because these aren't accumulated from many centers. These are just data from one center. So it's 14 out of 22. Low numbers, but clearly they could save more than half. And at Nagano Children's Hospital in Japan, my goodness, they say at 22 weeks, again, low numbers, but they can save uh, between 81 and 93%. They save most of these kids born at 22 weeks or at 23 weeks. So you see there's a wide range of survival depending on which centers we look at, which countries we look at. But clearly those who said it's impossible to save a kid at 22 weeks or at 23 weeks, um, that's simply not true. At the major centers in places like the United States or Sweden, uh, or Canada, or Japan. But I realize I'm spoken to, speaking to folks here from all over the world. So this becomes very important that your data are relevant to this. It's interesting to know what they can do at the Nagano Children's Hospital in Japan, which is far better than what we can do at my center at this point, and probably better what they can do at your center. But um, your data, where you are, are going to be relevant to this question when you're looking at the prognosis with and without the treatment under consideration. Now, of course, disability is the other big question that looms when we talk about extreme prematurity. And they all they don't all flourish to the same degree in the same way or at the same pace. And everybody knows that kids born at 22 or 23 weeks or 24 weeks, that these children are all left with serious, severe disabilities. Everyone knows this. But like a lot of things that everyone knows, it turns out not to be true. If we look at these data, again, from the U.S. Neonatal Research Network, they say they, in the red box, you see 22 and 23 weekers. Uh, on the on the y-axis, you can see the percentage of kids. And on the x-axis, you see the, the bars for severe, moderate, or no or mild neurodevelopmental impairment. And if you look at the 22 and 23 weekers, what you see roughly is that about a third of these kids are going to have severe neurodevelopmental impairment. And we're usually talking about cognitive impairment, cerebral palsy visual impairment or hearing impairment. About a third of these kids are gonna be left with severe neurodevelopmental impairment, about a third with moderate impairment, and about a third with no or mild impairment. So yes, cognitive disability and other disabilities are an important aspect of these decisions, no doubt. They're an important aspect of the prognosis, but the notion that all these kids are left with severe disabilities is simply not borne out by the data, neither in the US nor in other countries. And again, for example, in Japan, if we look at their neonatal research network, they found at 22 weeks, 46%. So about half of the kids um, had neurodevelopmental impairment and half of them, of course, uh, did not. But there's an important aspect of the disabilities, which I, I really um, uh, want to point out. And these are data now that are, again, nearly a generation old. They're from Maureen Hack in Ohio in the United States. And what she showed was that she looked at follow-up of 200 very low birth weight newborns. If you looked at those kids at 20 months, 39% of them had moderate to severe cognitive impairment. Look at those kids, same kids when they were eight years old, and 16% of them had moderate to severe cognitive impairment. Understand that when you look at these kids later, the outcome is far better than you thought it was going to be when you looked at them earlier. That the risk of severe disability is actually less. And so much of the outcome data that we look at is really based on two years 
18 to 24 months in that range, two-year outcomes. But it's important to know that those outcomes, in fact, give us an overly pessimistic view of how these kids are going to do in the long run, particularly when it comes to significant cognitive impairment. They do better when they're eight years old than we thought they would do when they were two years old. And again, these data have been reproduced all around the world, in the Europe as well as in, uh, in uh, New Zealand and Australia. But um, there's also, of course, a risk of later manifestations that might not be picked up in 20 months or two years, um, things like autism, for example. So we have to be very cautious when we talk about the disability that kids are going to be left with as we're counseling parents and as we're considering what we should do. Um, but there's another caution I want to share with you, which is the risk of quality of life considerations, right? We, we, we concern ourselves a lot with quality of life, and rightly so. But it's important to know that the physicians commonly have a, a, a worse perspective on a kid's quality of life than the parents. And in fact, the parents still have a lower perspective than the patient himself. This was show, shown by Saroj Segal in Canada, again, many years ago. The docs think the kids are doing here, but the, the parents think they're here and the kids themselves think they're here when you look at them as teenagers, former premature babies. So we sometimes conflate, we confuse quality of life with disability. This is something that's been observed in many different places in many different ways. It's referred to, you see here, as the disability paradox. And the disability paradox basically is that people who do not have a disability but are observing others who have it, those of, those of us who may see those kids, we are inclined to see their quality of life lower than they see it themselves. The people with the disability had judged their quality of life to be higher than those around them. That's the disability paradox. It's terribly important. We have to be very cautious when we assess another person's quality of life or anticipated quality of life, and when we make life and death decisions based on that. So another candidate justification for refusing, which I want to mention briefly, is that it would be futile to refuse. It would be futile to try. Should we try and save this baby? Now, we shouldn't try and do that because it, it would be futile. Um, and it's fascinating to me that this conversation is, this word is often used simply to stop conversations. Once we say it would be futile, that means we don't have to talk about it anymore. But physicians can't really agree on what futility even means. I actually just looked it up in the dictionary and found out futility is from the Latin futilis. It means leaky. It's based on the story of these women, the daughters of the god of Danius and mythology, who were condemned forever to carry water in leaky vessels. It can't work. It can't accomplish the goal. That's what feudal actually means. And there's a broad consensus within our profession that we're under no obligation to provide feudal treatment. But be aware that the societal consensus is actually less clear. Um, and the use of this term is really out of favor with ethicists because we as physicians, sadly, over years have used the term feudal not to help explain a situation to parents or patients, but rather to simply uh, stop the conversation. We have these buzzwords that we we'll use. Parents say, can we try and save this baby? No, we can't, because it'll be futile. Okay, well, it's not indicated, okay. Or he's not a candidate. We have these various terms that we use to stop the conversation. And the goal, of course, that every good physician knows, you all know, and any ethicist would endorse, is the goal is not simply to use a word to stop the explaining, but to help parents understand what's actually going on and why we're making the recommendations or decisions that we're making. So to say it would be futile as an answer to why we refuse to try to resuscitate, for example, we've got to be careful. But nevertheless, there is an adage in ethics that ought implies can, which is to say, you can't be obligated to do something if you cannot do it. I can't say you ought to run a mile in three minutes because that implies that it's possible. It's not possible for you to run a mile in three minutes. So you can't be obligated. It can't be obligatory if it can't be done. So in fact, position on the line is going to be informed by feasibility considerations. Something that's not feasible can't be obligatory. And importantly, the location on the line is sometimes influenced by location on the map. Now we're joined today with people from all over the world and, so, and various uh, physicians in various places are gonna have different levels of resources, personnel and equipment and money available to them, right? So what might be obligatory in a big city in, a, in one country um, might not be obligatory in a rural setting in another country where the resources simply aren't available. 
the availability of resources is going to also determine where a treatment is located on that line. So what determines and changes the location of the line? The prognosis, the data. We are physicians. We have to be based on data, right? Also the feasibility, medical and economic, and where you are. Those are what's going to determine the location of a given treatment on that line. But there's a third component, of course, which is the relevant rights. So let's talk about the rights here. You can't invite an ethicist to come and talk without having to hear about rights at some point. Okay, so forgive me. But we're going to talk about this for a minute. Let's talk about the rights that are at stake in the question we're trying to answer. When should we offer resuscitation or be willing to provide it? Let's do a rights-based analysis. There's lots of rights at play here, right? Certainly the parents have a right to honest information, which includes all ethically permissible options. And they have a right to decide what's going to happen to their child. They have a right uh, to determine what medical treatments are given to their child. But that's what is referred to really as a prima facie right, which means it can be trumped or overruled by other rights, right? So we are trying to find what's our threshold where we seek to override a parental decision. What's more important than the parent's right to decide? Sometimes it's the child's rights that may actually be more important than the parent's rights. And I recognize also that this is, this is a lecture for folks all over the world, and much of this is going to be culturally determined. So forgive me, because some of this is going to be based on, um, on a very Western approach and a very American approach to rights. And I am going to trust you folks to take the information I present to you and to incorporate it as you see fit into the work that you do. But I will tell you that for me and within the United States, sometimes we will say that a child's right to treatment actually overrides or is more important than the parent's right to decide. There was a statement now a generation ago from the American Academy of Pediatrics that says we believe all children deserve effective medical treatment likely to prevent substantial harm or suffering or death. So if the parents refuse a treatment that we think is likely going to save a child's life, okay, we think the child deserves that treatment, and we may actually seek to override the parent's refusal. So as much as we are, the door we come in on is shared decision-making, let's work together to come to a decision. If the parents absolutely refuse something that we think the child needs to save his life, and the, I mean, a classic example um, that's used by ethicists forever is, is families who refuse blood transfusion. They might refuse transfusion based on religious grounds. And American physicians will say, we won't accept that refusal. We'll actually go to the courts if necessary. We think that child has a right to treatment likely to prevent substantial harm or suffering or death. There's another right that the child has that was talked about less often, but I think is really important. And this is the child's right to mercy. It's a phrase that's not commonly used, but I think you guys are, are, are very familiar with the concept. What it means is the child has a right not to be subjected to a treatment that is not going to offer the child any benefit, particularly a painful treatment. So if parents request a treatment that's going to be painful, difficult for the child, but doesn't really offer the child any benefit, we feel that that child's right to mercy will at times override uh, the parent's right to decide. So I've got the parent's right on one hand, which is almost absolute, but not entirely. And have the child the right to certain basic things, to the treatment in certain settings, or to be spared a difficult treatment in certain settings. And of course, there's other rights that could be at play here as well. The family's best interest, society's best interest. And importantly, within the consideration of society's best interest, we have considerations of distributive justice, right? Which is to say, consideration about a fair allocation of limited resources. How many resources can we use on this one child? And what's the impact of that on the care of so many other children? And, and so one might one well might argue that, well, we could use these resources to save this one child, but in so doing, we'll deny 10 or 50 other children that same, with that same amount of money, that's those same resources, we could save so many other children. And balancing the needs of these different individuals, all these rights are, are in play. And depending on where you are, they're going to have various degrees of importance. So we're still trying to determine what locates and changes the position on that line for a given treatment. The prognosis, the data, the feasibility, medical and economic, the relevant rights that we've just reviewed. And there's something else as well. And for that, I would tell you, please, a very brief story. And it's about the technology known as ECMO, which most of you are familiar with. 
extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, essentially heart-lung bypass that's used among other settings. It's used in newborns with respiratory failure who we simply cannot adequately oxygenate or ventilate despite mechanical ventilation and 100% oxygen. When we can't do it with a ventilator, we do have recourse to ECMO, which is very expensive, very labor intensive. And this has been something that's really um, widely available in the United States and in Europe and, and in other places as well, of course. Um, I'd say since uh, you know the early 90s. One of the things I noticed, because uh, I'm unfortunately I've been around since then and before then watching these things, is that in the early days, um, children with trisomy 21 with Down syndrome were not considered candidates for ECMO. We were not going to give this kid ECMO because he has trisomy 21. But over the years, it struck me that the ECMO teams became increasingly willing to provide ECMO to these kids. And so I approached the ECMO team here at Yale and I said, we should actually study this. And so we reached out to 81 ECMO centers in, in the US and Europe. And we asked them this, we asked many questions about ECMO, but this question is relevant to what I wanna say here today. We said that assuming a patient meets respiratory criteria and there are no other contraindications, would you offer ECMO in the presence of trisomy 21? Choices were never rarely, sometimes, usually, or always. To say, would you offer, suggest you consider it ethically permissible because as went over if it's not ethically permissible we shouldn't be offering it right um so is it actually ethically permissible to put kids with trisomy 21 on ECMO or make it available to the parents to see if they want it and what we were surprised to see was that two out of three 68 percent said usually or always they'll offer it that fascinates me what changed over the course of those 15 or 20 years why did ECMO move on that line from being impermissible to being permissible? Was the prognosis changed? No, there was no new data about ECMO and trisomy 21. There was no new data about kids with trisomy 21 and the degree of disability that they're going to be left with. You're all familiar with that. Perhaps it was our attitudes about ECMO, no longer seen as a novel therapy, or about trisomy 21 or people cognitive disability in general. Our attitudes seem to have changed. And that moves things on the line as well, how we feel about certain things, especially disability. So what determines and changes location online prognosis, the data, feasibility, relevant rights, and frankly, our attitudes about novel therapies, therapies about disability, about moral status. And moral status really referring to how much an individual's interests should count. Uh, this is per, for the philosopher Marianne Warren has written a lot about this. And, and just how much does someone's interest count? We might think, well, all human beings should be seen as having equal moral status, right? Their interests should count equally. That's one point of view. Sadly, human history suggests otherwise. Human history suggests, and including the current day, that some individuals are seen to have more value than others. Their interests seem to count more. I think the perceived moral status of an individual is gonna inform the perceived rights and obligations that we have toward that individual. And that's going to include, that's going to include extremely preterm babies or babies who are likely to be left with a significant disability, such as kids with trisomies. Now, there's one other concept I want to introduce to the discussion. I appreciate you guys staying with me. We're almost done here. There's another concept that's important to this, which is justice. Now, justice, you know, uh, from Aristotle would tell us that we should treat equals equally and that unequal treatment must be justified by a morally relevant difference. Now, if it's a morally relevant difference, we say, well, one, one is, um, this is a rich man and this is a poor man. Should we treat them the same? Well, is, that's a difference, but is that a morally relevant difference? Um, in, uh, in American medicine, we would say it should not be. In reality, perhaps sometimes it is, both in the US and around the world. When we look at some, we say their ethnicity is a difference, but it shouldn't be morally relevant to the questions at hand. So we look for injustice. As we approach any of these things, we are always have our eye out for injustice. So with that in mind, I wanna go back to the questions we talked about at the beginning. At what gestational age should we be willing to attempt resuscitation? And at what gestational age should we insist on attempting resuscitation, right? Now, here's the deal. I think those are the wrong questions. So I'm gonna tell you now that I reject the premise. The premise here being that we should be basing these decisions on gestational age. I think it should be based not on what gestational age, but on what prognosis. As I've shared with you, I believe that based on that IPO framework, we're gonna locate a treatment there largely 
based on the prognosis with and without the treatment. Okay. Now, many of you are familiar with this. If not, I, I, it's an interesting read. It's available online. You'll see the address there. This is the Extremely Preterm Birth Outcomes Tool. It's uh, put online by the uh, National Institute of Child Health and Development, uh, the, the National Institutes of Health in the United States. And you can plug in a few factors and you can get the likelihood of survival and the likelihood of disability. This is helpful. It doesn't make an absolutely reliable prediction for a given child, but it's helpful in reaching predictions. So follow me on this, if you will. We can put in just, just these factors, the gestational age, the weight, whether it's a singleton or multiple, the presence or absence uh, of steroids and uh, the sex. Those five factors we can put in and we'll get a prediction. So look at, if you will, the first line here, we see that a 22 week female who weighs 450 grams, a singleton with no antenatal steroids has a 20% chance of survival if we try with active resuscitation. Thankfully, it's now listed both overall and with active resuscitation. Now the profound, on the right, you see the neurodevelopmental impairment at 18 to 26 months. We see profound is six to 11% and moderate to severe is 52 to 78%. All right, here's what's interesting. So the, the disability, now look at this, the 22 week female and the 23 week male who are otherwise the same, the female actually has a better chance of surviving than the male, 20% versus 50, 15%. And yet there are places that would say to the parents of that 23 week male soon to be born, well, we are willing to try, but to the 22 week female soon to be born, to those parents in the next room, no, I'm sorry, that's below our threshold, we won't try. Even though that kid's got a better chance of survival, a better prognosis. <clears throat> I think that's unjust. At the other end, if we look at the 25 week male and the 24 week female that are otherwise the same, and we see that they have about the same survival and the same disability predictions. Nevertheless, there are those that would say in the United States, by 25 weeks for the male, we have to try. The parents no longer get a choice. But 24 weeks for the female, the parents still get a choice. Even though we look and we see their prognosis, it's roughly the same. Now, if these people, these babies are going to be treated differently, we should be looking for a morally relevant difference. I think the gestational age in isolated fashion is not a morally relevant difference. I think all these figures, all these uh, uh, issues, uh, factors should be taken into consideration when we're deciding whether or not to offer treatment to parents, whether or not to make something available to parents. And to do otherwise, I think is fundamentally an injustice. Now, many folks, depending on where you are, are going to look at these numbers and say, these aren't even relevant to me. We're not going to resuscitate at 22 weeks. We don't have the resources. We don't have the capabilities. Okay, I get it. Because remember, looking at that impermissible, permissible, obligatory, one of the things that's going to locate the treatment on that line is going to be the feasibility, including the resources available. But whatever numbers you plug in here, if you're basing it on gestational age alone, if for you the issue is not between 22 and 23 weeks, but between 26 and 28 weeks, fair enough. You can plug those numbers in uh, as well, get a prognosis for those as well. And again, the prognosis at major U.S. academic centers that go into creating this database may not be relevant to you where you are. You might wanna look at the, at the data from your country, from your centers, right? You wanna take a look. But again, ask yourself, if we're making a treatment available for one child, but not another, what's the morally relevant difference between those kids? And I think the action is that prognosis. And I'm not, of course, the first person to realize this. John Tyson from Texas back in 2008 talked about moving beyond gestational age when he and the others in that network, in that American network, created that outcomes estimator tool that was based not just on gestational age, but also considered size and sex and plurality and the presence or absence of antenatal steroids. When they considered all those factors, okay, then he said, we have to move beyond gestational age. Now in 2015, the network, uh, Matt Rashavi published in the New England Journal, the network updated there based on new data. And in 2020, uh, Brian Carter and I wrote a paper uh, basically uh, finally moving beyond gestational age as a tip of the hat to John Tyson, because of course this was now 12 years later and people were still basing these decisions solely on gestational age. Those five factors are a better proxy for prognosis than gestational age alone. And it represents, I think, an injustice to kids.
to offer treatment to one child, uh, but not another when the second child actually has a better prognosis. So uh, in closing, I wanna talk about sound ethical decision-making in the NICU and how it relates to this. So specifically, a valid argument, a valid argument um, means the premises lead to the conclusion. And a sound argument is a valid one, plus the premises themselves are true. But the premise of the original question posed was that the decision should be based on gestational age. The premise of the reasoning and ethical decision-making in NICU is essentially the data, or at least includes the data. So we have to begin with an accurate look at the data, okay? And of course, the premise that gestational age is a good predictor of survival or of prognosis, that premise is not valid. So therefore, even if the reasoning is valid, it's not a sound argument. Now, you've all heard the expression, good ethics begins with good data, and sign me up. I quite agree with that. Um, I think that sound ethical reasoning then begins with good data, and it applies to those good data to established values and logic. Um, and the, probably the most important case in the United States in, this, in, in the last 50 years was a, a famous case that took place out in the Midwest in Indiana um, called the Baby Doe case. And essentially, this was a child who had esophageal atresia and an underlying disorder. And the question was, should they fix the esophageal atresia, the tracheoesophageal fistula, actually? And there was an argument presented that this child, because of an underlying medical problem in the baby doe case, had no chance of any reasonable quality of life. Based on that, there was, I think, valid reasoning that said, okay, based on that, the parents should not have to fix the tracheoesophageal fistula. The child should be allowed to die if that's what the parents want. And that's what was decided in 1982 in that baby doe case. But here's the thing. The child, the underlying medical condition was trisomy 21. Many people on this call have met people with trisomy 21. They don't lead the same life that you or I lead. But to say they have no chance of any quality of life is clearly misrepresenting the data. So many of these people with trisomy 21, they laugh, they have loving relationships, they can get pleasure out of life. They have some quality of life. So the reasoning that allowed them to decide to let this child die was based on that false premise. We need to base our reasoning on good data. It has to start with good data. Whatever conversations we're having have to go there. So in summary, for ethical decision-making in neonatology, the IPO, impermissible, permissible, obligatory framework that I've explained, offers a just and feasible approach to resuscitation decisions for extremely premature newborns, but importantly to all ethical decisions that we face in neonatology. And the location on the line should be based on the prognosis, the data about benefits and burdens, on feasibility, and on the relevant rights, and will inevitably be influenced by our attitudes about moral status and disability. So we have to have our eyes open to potential injustice. So what are we going to do? Here's what I suggest we do wherever we are, okay, is we approach this as a team. And in advance, we don't wait until someone's in labor at 23 or 22 or 24 or 25 weeks. We need, at each place, a plan in advance. I think wherever you are, you and the people you practice medicine with should sit down, clarify and articulate the question, review the data, including the prognosis, and challenge the premises. Consider the relevant principles and rights. Consider the current law policies and feasibility considerations where you are. Discuss among colleagues and others, including non-medical individuals, and then, then agree upon a just and feasible plan, what you will and won't offer parents in certain situations, but only after consideration of all of these things. And the question needs to be revisited periodically. The hard ethical questions we're going to face, right? We can approach these questions and approach these questions based simply on standard of care or on appeals to authority. But my friends, I suggest to you that for the hard ethical questions, we need to do the hard ethical work. We need to examine the data. We need to examine the principles at play. And I think application of this framework will help us to approach those questions. And without doing that hard ethical work, not simply asking the boss, without doing that hard ethical work, um, there can be no moral progress. Um, I, my time is now up. I am so grateful for your attention. 
uh, and I'm happy to have any discussions um, that you wish. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing these screens, and then uh, I'll, I'll leave it to our moderators to take us from here. Thank you, sir. So I would now request the moderators to kindly initiate the discussion. We have a lot of interesting questions in the Q&A box. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mark, for an interesting presentation, especially the IPO framework. And I like the cricket picture at the end. So over to Dr. Shaw, maybe start off with some and then we can come back. So uh, thank you, Professor Makurio. Uh, it was a very insightful uh, presentation and uh, we really learned a lot today. Uh, there are multiple uh, questions uh, already has come to the question and answer box. The first question I'll take uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Alnemri. Uh, he says, I feel sometimes it's difficult to decide not to resuscitate borderline variable premature if you are not backed up and supported by administration and national guidelines. Uh, he feels in Saudi Arabia, he faces this kind of questions. What would be your answer to him? Well, I think that, that it's it's important that the organization be on the same page. That's why I say well, you have to approach it as a team. And the answer to how it's done at your institution, and, and you say Saudi Arabia is where he is, um, the answer to how it's approached in Saudi Arabia or at that institution doesn't have to be the same answer in India or the United States. But what I would say is that what, you, what we can't do is to say that, well, during the day, so today I would offer it, but of course at night my associate, she would not offer it, but tomorrow my other associate, she would offer it. We can't do that. We can't practice neonatology that way. We as neonatologists have to be together. So I would say, as you get everyone together to consider the data, to consider the national guidelines, to consider the, the uh, ethical issues at play, that conversation should certainly include all the neonatologists who ultimately are going to make this decision, but also can include other members of the institution, including leadership of the institution, because I do think it's going to be helpful to have everyone on board. You can't have different people at the institution approaching this different ways. And so, among other things, at the, at the outset, I think that the folks that are working at that institution need to agree, whatever we as a group decide, we're all going to do that. We can't have everybody doing it differently. It's not fair to the patients or the families. It's not fair to the nurses. It's not fair to each other. We can't we can't be doing it that way. So yes, get everybody on board with one plan. He also mentions that uh, is it time or the attitude that uh, makes us to change our decision to treat or not? Like he gives an example, like AV canal defect in Down syndrome. He says the early 80s and 90s uh, surgery was uh, not to be offered. But today, AV canal defect in Down syndrome is uh, in the top of the list of pediatric cardiovascular surgery. So with time, uh, things change and also with attitude. That's what he says. Uh, there's another question from Dr. Sumesh. He says, uh, he asks, above what gestational age would you resuscitate a baby against the wishes of the parents? And uh, also he asked, beyond what gestational age is child's right to leave supersedes parents' right to refuse? So uh, let me answer the first question and then, then clarify the second one. So at what point will we resuscitate over a parental refusal? That happens so rarely in our work in the United States. What we have is parents who want very aggressively for these resuscitations to happen. But it has happened. The last time it happened to me was several years ago, actually, and it was parents from another country. Um, and who felt that in their culture, they wouldn't try and save a baby like this. I think that decision should be based on prognosis. And, and there's no magic number I could give. I will tell you what we do here, to be fair with you. I would say that, that here at Yale, we say, if there's at least a two out of three chance, 67% chance that a child's going to, if we try, that we can save a child, um, a child's gonna survive without severe disability or profound disability. Um, if we can save a child to that extent, then yes, we feel obligated to do it. Now that number, 67%, should it be 50%? Should it be 75%? This isn't handed down by God. This is something that, that a room full of people eventually came to an agreement on, but there was much disagreement. There was, I think, as many who felt it should be 50% chance. At some point, the prognosis with treatment will be so good that the child has a right to that try. And I think that for each place, some folks have to say, how good does the prognosis have to be? My I guess my important message is it should be based on 
prognosis and not simply based on, well, we just said, okay, we drew an arbitrary line at some gestational age. So if at your place, you know that that for a certain child, there's a 80% chance you could save that child and he wouldn't be left with a severe or profound disability, then I would say, okay, I would do that. Even if the parents objected, I would explain to them why we felt obligated to do it. There are those who say, no, you should never do that. It should always be the parent's choice, but take it to the extreme. If you had that full-term baby who just needed some antibiotics and the parents said, nope, don't do it. Let him go because he has a rash on his face. And I don't like how that rash looks or has a birthmark on his face. You wouldn't say, okay, we'll let him die. So there's going to be some threshold we'd all reach where we would say to parents, we feel we must do this for this child. I, If I say the number is 67%, um, I think any child who's going to be left with a profound disability, I don't think we should force that resuscitation on parents. So for example, a child with trisomy 13 or trisomy 18, I do think for some of those kids, we should be willing to resuscitate if that's what parents want. But I don't think, for me personally, and I don't think for any physicians in the United States right now, that's considered ethically obligatory, where we would do that over parental objections. Mm-hmm. At some point, the prognosis gets so good. I think roughly between half and two-thirds chance of survival um, without a profound disability. Those are kids who are entitled to an attempt. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mark, for that answer. But uh, there's another question which probably doesn't come up uh, in the U.S., uh, most of your patients would be having insurance and they would be taken care of either the state or the insurance. Uh, Dr. Sushma has asked a question. Uh, if the parents ask not to resuscitate because uh, of their financial uh, position, uh, how would that look like from an ethical viewpoint? Wow, that's really hard, isn't it? Um, I think that there's some threshold where the hardship for the child and for the parents may be such that it would be ethical not to provide the resuscitation. But but <clears throat> this is really troubling for me and I think for all of you, because I think that we feel our practice should primarily and our ethics should primarily be focused on the child. How is this going to, going to harm the family? And this is why I mentioned all the rights should be considered in this. And so what this comes down to is how much should the rights of the other family members go into locating it on that spectrum? When does it no longer become obligatory? If the parents say, please don't, because this is going to be harmful to our family. I do think there's some level of harm to the family that may be reached where we'd say, if this is so harmful to the family, that it may be ethically acceptable to forego resuscitation based on the harm to others. I will tell you that in the United States and the work that I do, and I know this is different in other parts of the world, we would say that that we have to focus on the child. And frankly, if the parents say we simply cannot afford this, that then we would find someone else who would care for the child. It might not be as good as if the child had grown up in his family. It might not be as good as growing up in an ideal circumstance, but we would argue that it's better than than letting the child die. So I don't have an easy, quick answer. I do think there would be some threshold where the rights of other people um, could be such that it, it could lead to not resuscitating. But for me, that's a very, very difficult threshold to reach. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, the, and it becomes interesting because you, you, you are in an American system where the individual gra- gains precedence over society or community. Individual rights are more respected, but in the Asian consent co- context or in our context, generally it's uh, the community which kind of takes precedence over individual. So I think uh, how, how would that uh, balance decision making? Because you would be looking at from an individual perspective, as you mentioned, the child's rights takes precedence. So, but from a community, because a lot of times uh, decisions in the NICU are not taken by the parents, but by elders in the family or sometimes even village leaders, not even uh, the parents or the relatives. That So, so as you rightfully point out, uh, Dr. Nambakar, so, so in the system where I have been used to working my entire career, the authority rests with the parents. Now, it's not entirely with the parents because the parents, their decision can on rare occasion actually be overridden by the physicians or by the courts, right? But it's with the parents, not with the grandparents, not with the elders, uh, not with religious leaders, etc. I recognize that in different places of the world, there's going to be a different culture. <coughs> I also recognize that the way we do it 
in, for example, the United States, isn't necessarily the only way or the right way. I mean, I've taught for years. We, for example, give authority to parents, but not to grandparents. And why do we do that? Well, this dates back to Roman times and before. This has been the Western tradition for centuries and centuries. But that doesn't mean it's the only way to do it or the right way to do it. If someone in some other part of the world said, well, it's actually the grandparents that have the authority, and here's why. I think that those in the United States, those in Europe, et cetera, need to have their eyes open to the fact, we need to have our eyes open to the fact that in other places, that authority may rest with others. For example, the grandparents. Um, I think for each one, one has to consider the rights of all involved and is it fair? So for wherever you are, and I recognize this being looked at by folks from all over the world, wherever you are, you have to practice medicine within the context of your culture. But you also have to look at that and ask, is this, is the cultural approach here fair? Is it just? And take a look back on what for you are the fundamental ethical principles that you want to focus on. And if in fact the customs by your lights are in fact unjust, then one needs to push against those customs, I think. It's going to be, it's not for me to say, um, but for you, wherever you are and what you're doing. So the, the, the principles that I've raised uh, that I've asked you to consider are the attitudes, uh, for example, specifically about moral status and equal moral status for human beings and about justice, um, as well as the children sometimes having rights that supersede the rights of others. These are the principles that are central to what I do and how I approach these things. And the parents having a great deal of authority in this situation as well. That's, those are the principles that I think have to be foundational for this. I'm not telling you, you must adopt my principles and apply them. What I am suggesting to you is you, my friends, wherever you are, need to sit with your colleagues and others where you work and say, what are our ethical principles? What is our North Star? What are we going to do to guide us to make sure we're doing the right thing as best we can? doesn't have to be what I say here today, but I really would hope it can be something more than just, well, this has always been our tradition, so therefore this is what we're going to do. I think ethical reasoning has to get past that. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Subhash, can you take the next questions, please? Are you muted, I think. Are you muted? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Janaki asks, if you resuscitated a baby against parental wishes, would you legally be in a problem due to cost or disability, etc.? So, would you legally be in a problem? So, here is the sad reality in the United States, um, which is you can get legally in trouble for just putting your socks on in the morning. Um, uh, so, th if if one were to legally were to excuse me resuscitate a baby over parental wishes. I think yes. the best protection one has against legal troubles is one that this is consistent with the practice in our institution. So it's not just something I decided to do at this point, which is why I think that these conversations, wherever you are, need to happen before the crisis. Let's consider these situations and how we're going to approach them as a group. And the second is that when you have legal assistance, wherever you are, is to reach out to them and let them know, listen, parents did not want this child resuscitated. We've chosen to do it, and here's why. And make sure that the folks, the attorneys, or wherever you are, who give you legal assistance are on board and able to help you. It is possible to get in legal trouble for doing something that the parents don't want us to do. That is possible. Those are the two things I think that we can mitigate that. The third, of course, is to be aware of what the laws and regulations are where you practice. Um, and hopefully, uh, many of you have some legal assistance somewhere in the organization you work in that can help provide that. The, the next comment uh, from Dr. Rajiv Thapar is uh, uh, in uh, resource restricted geographical regions, pushing for such lower gestational babies is always a dilemma uh, because the availability of resources as well as financial burden are the considerations which do merit along with other factors as quoted by the speaker. Uh, this is his comment, uh, not a question. Then uh, Dr. Arjun Day, he asked, sometimes parents simply demand for an intact survival, regardless of gestational age. How do you deal with that situation, especially when gestational age is around 24 to 26 weeks, otherwise uh, unremarkable pregnancy? So how do you uh, deal with this situation when parents demand an intact survival, irrespective of gestational age? 
So that's a great question. And, that, and that's a really important subject to bring up. And I, and, and I know all, all the guys who've organized this, and I think the person who asked the question, everyone else is well aware, we're not in a position to ever guarantee anything. And we need to be honest with that going in. When a baby's born at full term, right? And a baby has mild respiratory distress syndrome, and I put the baby in oxygen for a few hours, I can't guarantee the baby's going to be fine. When a baby has nothing wrong with him, we're never in a position to guarantee it, right? And we need to be honest with parents going in and to tell them that we can't promise you this child won't be left with disability. Um, but if we have, we can say, however, that the likelihood of severe disability is low enough that we feel the child has this right to treatment. Because again, where I work, and each of you has to examine where you work and what your cultural mores are, that we say that people with certain levels of disability are still entitled to medical care. So if parents had a child who had a certain level of disability, and therefore don't give this child treatment for his infection, don't give this child immunizations, et cetera, we would say, um, depending on the level of disability, but in general, we would say, no, we're going to do this. Um, that the child's rights actually weigh into this. So I would try and help the parents understand this. But folks who say, I demand, uh, you know, uh, a perfect outcome uh, that they need to be uh, disavowed. They need to. They need to be under. They need to be made to understand. We can never promise that. We can say, you know what? Most kids who are born at this gestational age, who are this size, who are doing like this, most of these kids end up doing well. That's what I think is likely to happen here. But I cannot promise it. So, uh, uh, next question is from Doctor Sif Sajan Saini. He asks. Uh, should the parental quality of life be a parameter to be considered, keeping in mind the lack of social support and nuclear family structure? Yeah, isn't that, that's a terrible question wherever you are, including uh, in the, the, the wealthiest parts of the United States, it still becomes an issue because for some kids, those support structures afterwards are simply not there. And so I do think it's fair to consider that stuff. I do think that the quality of life considerations, what the child will be left with, particularly when the support systems aren't in place adequately. I do think that it's a reasonable, appropriate to consider all that. However, I think the bar has to be pretty high for us to say this kid's quality of life, because there isn't a good uh, teacher for kids with special needs in our town, this kid's quality of life is so poor, he's better off being dead. That is a pretty dramatic statement to make. So I won't sit here and tell you that quality of life should never be considered. But as I said in the talk, we need to be very, very cautious about assigning a quality of life in an individual and then suggesting that because this individual's quality of life by our lights is going to be so poor that he's better off dead. That's a tough one. So I would be, you know, I would with great caution approach conclusions like that. It is true that the lack of resources makes things much more difficult for these kids and their families in some settings more than others. But in many settings, the lack of resources for years going forward make things more difficult than they need to be. I wish it were otherwise, but I don't necessarily mean think that that justifies uh, always allowing a kid with a disability to die. I don't think that stands as a justification for letting kids with disabilities die. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mark. Uh, I actually had another question follow up to the previous discussion that we had across cultures. In the US itself, you would have varying cultures across various states. Uh, you have conservative sections, you have se uh, sections which are uh, more liberal. There are people who stay on reservations. Uh, there are immigrants or new, newer immigrants maybe in the last 20, 30 years. So uh, is the application of ethics in a particular center the same way to all of them or would you offer uh, slightly differently and how you approach this kind of people? Great question and a fair question. Um, and I can't speak for every medical center in the United States. I can speak for, for the academic centers and I've, and I've visited most of the states in the United States and spoken for many places for many years. And the newborn ICU here, we're really very fortunate that um, in the newborn ICU commonly, we don't even know which baby comes from the very poor family and which one comes from the wealthier family. Once you get to know the families, you may find that out. But um, the goal is, the ideal is that all these kids get treated the same way. That an immigrant child, for example, versus a child who's from a wealthy family, a wealthy American family, 
that that's a difference potentially, right? But not a morally relevant difference in terms of how we treat these kids. And so, no, I think that we would seek to provide the same level of care to all these kids, recognizing that some families themselves are going to require a different care, a different approach. Some folks speak English, some don't, right? Some folks have an easy time getting to the hospital. Some folks have a very difficult time getting to the hospital and so many other differences that are going to, depending on their background and their resources. But, but the questioner is absolutely right that there's a wide spectrum of wealth within the United States. In the newborn intensive care units, we try not to have that affect the, the quality or the level of care that we provide. Now, it's true, though, if we get more subtle, that we say that, that in, in urban centers, so some of the poorest people in the United States live in some of our big cities. Within those centers, there are very good newborn intensive care units that provide care to those kids. The problem then, of course, is then when they go home and what's available to them after that. So we do a pretty good job, I think, of making a lot of wonderful care available to these newborns, even to the poorest parents. Um, I don't think we do as good a job uh, in making sure that those kids get what they need after they leave the newborn intensive care unit, after they go home. But within our NICU, we don't have a separate set of ethics for immigrants or for uh, or for poor families. Thank you, thank you. Great answer. So uh, another question, actually, it's a question that I had, uh, and it's very interesting. You had this uh, statistic of 39% at 20 months and 16% at eight years for moderate to severe disability across various uh, US as well as probably Europe and other places. So what is the reason that this uh, statistic is there? How does disability decrease or or is, is it the way we evaluated changes? So that, that's a great question. And I don't, uh, please, I don't claim to be an expert on neonatal follow-up. That was the data that you're quoting was data I presented from Maureen Hack, was at one center out in Ohio who did this. But there are other uh, big national studies and much bigger studies in other places. And I, I think one was from Victoria. And there, there's, they've been from various places. I think what it comes down to, put simply, again, not as an expert in follow-up, is it is easier I mean, two, two possibilities come to mind. One is that it is easier to actually evaluate a child's cognitive abilities when he's eight years old compared to when he's two years old. One can get a better sense of that child's cognitive abilities. That's one, and it, he's not as bad as we thought he was going to be at two. The other big possibility, of course, is that there's some catching up, that he was still in trouble at two, but actually a lot of those kids catch up or at least come closer to being caught up. It's kind of like catch up physical growth, right? That they That they may not reach that, that those same kids, those tiniest babies, might not reach the same level of cognitive ability as their full-term siblings, but they come closer as they get older. Um, and either of those could be true, but I don't want to pretend to have expertise I don't have. But the observation has been made in many places that we get a better sense when they're older, six years old to eight years old. And in fact, that suggests that the predictions that are based on two years old are overly pessimistic when it comes to severe impairment. But there are other things that are gonna come up, behavioral issues, learning issues, autism, other things that are gonna come up that are still gonna be very important to the kid and to the parents. Thank you. Uh, question from one of the viewers, uh, Dr. Madhav Barua. Uh, it's not really ethics, but uh, relevant. How to confirm exact gestation in the delivery room in babies with borderline viability, especially in resource limited settings? Great. So how do, if I understand the question was how to confirm gestational age in the delivery room? In resource limited settings. So I don't know. In, I, in, the, in the resource limited settings. Oh, I, I got news. You're all going to do as good a job as I'm going to do. So um, it's important to know that neonatologists, and I think most neonatologists on the call know this, is that we're not really good at this. You know, I, 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 have, I have told the story sometimes that once I had two kids years ago in the newborn intensive care unit, and one was absolutely, uh, you could tell by looking at the kid, is there, they were brand new, they'd just been born, they were brought in. And one was clearly like a 23 weeker, the skin was transparent, the eyes were even fused, the eyelids were fused. And the other kid right in the next bed, this kid, the eyes were open, the skin was much more developed. Um, you could see that kid was more like 25 weeks. Well, I can't tell you what they were, but I can tell you this, whatever they were, it was the same thing because they were twins. And one twin looks like 23, the other one looks like 25. None of us can tell in the delivery room exactly what someone's gestational age is. We can't. So the good news is that if you're in a completely uh, you know, resource-limited rural setting, 
you can do as well with that as, as I can at Yale or as anyone can. What I do have access to at Yale, what you have access to in the major centers, of course, is the best estimates we have, which are obstetrical estimates. The best obstetrical estimate is what we go on. So I will not look at a kid in the delivery room and say, the obstetrician said this kid was 24, but he looks more like 22 to me. You know what? He's, an, he's probably an immature 24. Maybe he's somewhere in between, but we should see those error bars. When the obstetricians give us a gestational age, we should see error bars around that. I mean, the seasoned neonatologist, when the obstetrician says, I got a kid about to be born and he's 24 weeks, you know, so the resident says, okay, thanks. But the neonatology attending is thinking, 24 weeks based on what? And the guy says, well, based on an ultrasound at six weeks, okay, that's pretty good. Or if he says, well, this was an unregistered mother, she just came in today and I did an ultrasound. Now, when they say 24 weeks, I think somewhere between 22 and 26 weeks. It's plus or minus a couple of weeks. So the best obstetrical estimate is going to have error bars around it, depending on how it was obtained. And it's likely going to be better than what we can do as pediatricians. We had these exams that we relied on the Ballard exam and said, looking at the creases on the foot, feeling the cartilage in the ears and so on. This stuff is all interesting and helpful. You can even look at the lenses in the, in the anterior aspect of the eye, right? You can, not the lens, excuse me, the vessels in the lens. This stuff is all approximate. We don't have a way to get the exact gestational age. In general, the obstetricians are better at it than we are. Uh, my way of looking at it is just like, maybe it doesn't matter. You just go and resuscitate. We'll take it for, from there. That's another way of looking at it. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Shaw. Ah, again, mute. Dr. Shaw. Please unmute, Subhash. Sorry. So um, one very interesting question, which is very relevant from our setting, that is like an Indian setting. Uh, Dr. Thomas John asked that where extreme preterm delivery is imminent in the middle of the night, imagine the situation where only the junior doctor is on the floor who is not maybe adequately, um, you know, uh, well uh, skilled. And the gestational age is uncertain, like, for example, an unbooked single mom who is somewhere between 22 to 26 weeks. How should the doctor approach the resuscitation? Now, premise is this, that estimated weight is about 450 grams. Mother has not received any steroids. There is no hospital policy on this, and there is no time to phone for advice. The available data suggests that uh, we, in his center, 50% uh, chance of intact survival at 26 weeks, 40% at 24 weeks, and no survival at 20 to 23 weeks. So now this particular situation, what would your answer be? So in, in this particular situation, I would, I would actually want to know more, but I, I get the spirit of the question, which is, we're really not sure what this kid's prognosis is, right? Yes. Because we just yes. don't have adequate information. So we're unsure of the likelihood of survival. Yes. I, the general advice I would give is that if, if you're at a fork in the road and you can't figure which way to go and each path seems equally good or equally bad and you really can't figure which way to go, in general, in medicine, et cetera, I would suggest that we choose the path that's more easily reversed. So if I'm really not sure about the viability of a child, if I'm not sure of the situation in that setting, I would generally be willing to try because if I was clearly wrong and the kid's not viable, that's gonna become evident. Moreover, if over the next hours or even days, the mother says, I really don't wanna continue pursuing this, I can reverse that path more easily than if I don't attempt resuscitation. If the next day the mother understands the whole situation, we take a close look and say, wow, we could have saved this child. The mother wanted us to, well, now it's too late. So for situations like that, where people really aren't sure about prognosis, um, in general, I would say, again, without knowing the specifics of the case, not being there, in general, in the, in the setting of uncertainty about this, I would err on the side of trying. I would try because that's the path more easily reversed if it becomes evident that the wiser choice would have been not to resuscitate. But if we don't resuscitate, we can't reverse that path. Don't seem to see any other question. Thank you. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of uh, ask another question. I have got a lot of questions. One is you mentioned the self-fulfilling prophecy. It reminds me of uh, research which started off uh, and because of guidelines related to research, became more stringent. So I think around the 90s, uh, research of drugs in children kind of 
uh, so decrease the stop because it is not uh, what to say profit there is no profit in researching children's drugs so it kind of uh, and so it became kind of set because 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 rules became so stringent people stopped doing research and i think in 1995 fda had to bring out a rule saying that all drugs which are researched in adults should get research in children too after some time so that would be kind of a self fulfilling prophecy kind of you restrict restrict and then you really don't know don't have any data to do anything is that correct sort of in a different way yeah i mean i would say that that you make it difficult to get the, the newborns to participate in research and then you say well we don't have any data because we don't have newborns in research yeah so i think that that rules were made you're right maybe 20 25 years ago that made it more important to include newborns in research um so we have that but the self fulfilling prophecy is often we create a bad outcome so it's sort of what I was talking about, not exactly. I'm speaking about situations where we create a bad outcome by our actions, and then we use that bad outcome, or by our inaction more exactly, and then we use that bad outcome to justify continued inaction. And when sometimes we have to ask the question is, you know, what if we try, when folks say that this particular problem, whatever that problem is, is always fatal, and so we don't try, at some point the question might be, what would happen if we tried? Because that's a valid question that if I'm the grandfather or the father, I'm going to ask, what would happen if you tried? And then we got to tell the truth. And the truth often would be, we don't know. We got to be honest if we don't know the answer to that question. Uh, so uh, a last question from my side. Uh, you, when you are in a team of four, five people, six people or 10 people, and you're going to be deciding on a policy, uh, everyone would have a different uh, moral status to a particular problem. Somebody might be saying that, okay, we want to resuscitate or we will do more. Uh, another person might be uh, like reticent and may not want to do more or will say that they don't want to resuscitate. And uh, all of the team members, though we say everyone is the same, there will be different power equations in the team. Somebody will be senior, would have more charge. Others may not be at the same level or maybe uh, depending on the person who's making decisions. So how, how do you kind of decide this when you're making Sure. For a team. I, I would suggest, and, and, and again, some of this is going to depend on the culture of the unit where we're at. But I would say that that there may be different members of the faculty or different members of the team that have different status. The full professor may, may be seen as having more status or authority than the assistant professor, right? But as we're doing this, on any given night, any one of us could find ourselves as the attending neonatologist. So I think that we should each have equal voice in the conversation. Now, so if, if there are six neonatologists who work as a group, I think those six neonatologists sit around a table. If one is much more senior and more experienced and very highly respected, the others may be more likely to give credence to what he or she says. But everybody gets a chance to speak their piece. Everybody has an open mind willing to consider other people's points of view. And importantly, when we start, before we start, we say, we may well have different opinions about this. But we have to agree that when it's done, when we've all considered the data, when we've all considered the ethical questions, when we've heard each other, when we've get a chance to debate the moral questions, and when that's done, then what I would say is, then we're going to vote, and we all agree now that we're going to make a policy based on the will of the majority. So another way to go would be simply say that the boss, the head of the department, is going to hear from everybody and then make a decision. That would be another approach. That might be more uh, suitable, might be more comfortable for many places that the highest level physician decides for everybody. For me, for what I've recommended, um, is that it not be that way, that every attending physician, not the trainees, not the students, but every attending neonatologist gets an equal vote. And because we, we're all going to be in this boat in the middle of the night. And so then we're going to decide and then we're all going to stick by what we decide. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Subash, you want to make some comments before I kind of make the final ones uh, no uh, like um, uh, ethics is always very complex and there's no uh, no uh, i mean right or correct answer it depends on the culture depends on the situation in the premises i mean this legal thing so many so many things so a very interesting question i don't know uh, who to answer this question is uh, Dr. Parvati asks, have we arrived at a consensus or a cutoff gestational age for resuscitation in India? So I, I think I can answer that question a little bit because we just published in uh, yes. 
a journal a discussion on uh, this uh, exact same question uh, and the answer it is a discussion and the answer basically says that we will not give you a gestational age cutoff for all the re reasons which uh, dr uh, mark mercury has talked about today so uh, basically uh, it, when we say have we arrived at a consensus it should be actually your unit which has to arrive at a consensus and you who has to decide uh, we can't have a single gestational age cutoff for a town also forget about a state or a nation so i think it depends upon uh, that that particular area and uh, we have to follow the nrp guidelines as, as uh, was mentioned so yeah i'd be grateful if 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 you could or through manoj or somebody i would very much like to see that paper um I exactly. learn more about what's done in India. So, so I would love to see this. You see if you get that to me. I would send it to you, sir. I would send Thank it. You. Thank you very much. So, uh, uh, so I'll just make final comments. So thank you, Dr. Mercurio. Uh, Mark Mercurio, we had a very interesting uh, session. I actually liked uh, the various lighthouses you showed in many of your slides. I don't know why you, uh, you like lighthouses, but these are kind of directions. And of course, you started off with baseball and closed with cricket, a uh, picture of cricket. Uh, uh, the IPO framework that you have suggested is very excellent and very useful and many of us can start using it. Uh, I liked your thing of looking at data and not data on gestational age, but data on prognosis. So it, it makes us more responsible for collecting our data and using our own, own data. And uh, of course, very important that the disability paradox that which you, which you shared uh, is an interesting one and we should be definitely considering that uh, when we look at making decisions. It has been a wonderful uh, session and I have loved uh, moderating and then listening to it. Uh, back to you, Manush. Thank you. So I actually uh, reflect the mood of the majority of the viewers. Let me just quote uh, a comment I just received. Uh, from one of the very senior neontologists from Oman, um, who has written, uh, uh, he is a regular uh, uh, um, the participant of this uh, series. He has written a very illuminating presentation with interposition of carefully selected and relevant pictures. Uh, so uh, it is actually one of those uh, truly amazing presentations we have uh, we had here today. Thanks to the legend in this field, uh, Professor Mikurio. So uh, I, on behalf of uh, team Learn from the Legends and National Neontology Forum of India, express our sincere gratitude to you, sir, for having agreed to um, uh, give this lecture today. And uh, we expect to see you in person, as I uh, was remarking to you probably next year, uh, in uh, some of the events in our country, and then we to take the discussions forward. So um, uh, it is so nice of you. Thank you once again. Thank you so much. Well, thank you to, to, to certainly to the to, to your kind folks who've organized and moderated. Um, it was it was a real honor to be here with you and to have this conversation, um, and to all the folks who took the time uh, to listen. And I look forward to seeing you in the future, um, and to and to and to hopefully seeing your country. For now, um, just please know that I'm honored to have been asked to do this, and I wish you all the very best. Thank you, sir. And before we close, uh, I would also like to thank both the moderators, Dr. Somashekhan Balkar and Dr. Subhash Chandra Shaw, who have done an excellent job. Uh, I mean, uh, the challenges of moderating today's session were uh, really too, uh, uh, too much, but then they did a very great job out of it. And uh, at the end, I would like to thank all of you. Uh, our respected attendees who have been uh, with us for the last three and a half years. We have more than 10,000 registrations in the, uh, we have crossed uh, and uh, the, we uh, get very encouraging feedback, which is really uh, highly uh, humbling and uh, motivating for us. That is the reason why we were actually planning to discontinue the series after the pandemic was over, but we have, uh, thankfully, we, uh, we, we did not do that. That's why we were able to hear such a illuminating lectures. Uh, and uh, I would also, uh, so thank you for joining. And I would invite you to continue to join us. This month, we have one more session by another legend who's, um, uh, who probably, whose uh, uh, guidelines on uh, PDA or management was what we start, uh, what uh, probably was the first of the guidelines that followed 
but he is going to talk to us about a different topic. I am talking about Professor William Bennett's. Uh, from us uh, who is going he is going to talk to us about something else or of which also he has done original work but which uh, people are not aware so that's why we thought we'll have that lecture it is on neonatal sepsis and uh, that uh, talk is titled is it sepsis sick neonates with negative blood cultures so uh, invite you for this this is going to be on the same time the say uh, um, of that day and week on 21st september now uh, the uh, and the, the next month we will continue with the uh, lecture uh, di uh, dialogue we had on neonatal restoration what's new in neonatal restoration part 2 this is the, uh, basically we are talking about the survive trials lessons from chest compression survive trial by professor george uh, chandler from canada so and uh, the series will go on so uh, i would invite you to stay on uh, for uh, and thank you so much everyone for having joined today with uh, all your permission we will close today's session thank, thank you you. Thank you. Thank you. thank you sir thank you very much thank you sir i wish you thank you it was such a honor